This is The Speaking Show. I'm David Newman, and you're tuned in to the number one podcast for speakers, consultants, and experts who want to speak more profitably. Welcome to another episode. This time, you're in for a real treat. We have your sales maven. You don't know yet that she's your sales maven, but she is your sales maven, Nikki Rausch. Hi, thank you for having me. Man, I'll tell you the only thing that this audience, and yes, I'm talking to all y'all out there, this audience, the only thing they dislike more than marketing, which is what we teach them, is sales, (laughs) which is what you teach your clients. Maybe a good place to start is kind of sales reluctance. Why do so many independent professionals and speakers and consultants and small professional services firm owners, why do they just hate selling so much? I really think they hate selling so much because there's kind of a lot of fun made at salespeople. And we've all been on the receiving end of somebody who's doing it really poorly. It feels gross. It feels aggressive. Or it just feels, you know, very like, uh, slimy and you know all those things. And so, of course, that would make you shy away from it because you never want to be seen as gross or slimy or you know aggressive with somebody. So I really think it's just because they've been on the receiving end of somebody who's done it poorly. They don't want to be associated with that. And then I think the other problem is because we don't like it, we tend to abdicate our sales responsibility in our business. <laughs> Here's what you typically hear. And I'm sure you hear this from all the clients that work with you. Well, Nikki, you know, our business is pretty much based on referral. Uh, You know, Nikki, we don't really do a lot of outbound sales because people come to us. That's all code. And the code is we're leaving tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars on the table because we have completely abdicated our responsibility for sales and selling activities When someone comes to you with some of those talk tracks, oh, our business is all referral. No, we don't really pitch. We don't really sell. You know, our clients just come to us. A lot of word of mouth, Nikki. A lot of word of mouth brings us clients. What's your immediate thought that might not come out of your mouth? And then what (laughs) does come out of your mouth when you finally want to help them? Okay, so my immediate thought is you are definitely leaving money on the table. And not only are you leaving money on the table, but you are leaving people who engage with you in some way. They're leaving that conversation feeling very unsatisfied with you. And you may not realize they're unsatisfied, but they are because... Here's the truth of the matter. Most people will not decide to hire you until you invite them or until you ask for the sale. So when you're not asking, if you're not inviting, they're leaving that conversation feeling like, oh, well, you know, Nikki doesn't want to work with me or Nikki doesn't think I'm the right kind of client for her or she doesn't think it's possible for me, whatever she teaches. Or this is the craziest one. I hear this all the time because people reach out and tell me the opposite side of like, you know, I had a conversation with so-and-so and and they didn't invite me to work with them. They hate me. And I'm always like, I don't think they hate you. I think they missed the buying signals. They missed the opportunity to invite you. Now, what do I say to the person who says that? I always say, congratulations. That's so great that people are just flocking to you, paying you all the money that you want. Are you interested in growing your business even further? Because if so, there's a way to do that in a way that you get to be your authentic self and you get to leave people feeling much more satisfied with their engagement with you. Yeah, very, very important. Well, I want to ask you, let's kind of look at the Nikki journey, the professional journey that brought you to what you're doing today, what were sort of the stops along the way and uh, some of your sales experiences and then tell us about how you started your business and then how it's evolved through to today. Well, my first real dipping my toe in the water of sales is when I first moved up to Washington State. I needed a job, right? I was 20 years old. I got a job working in one of those mall kiosks. And it was the first time I ever had a commissioned sales job. You know, it was a minimum wage job, but I liked the idea that I could double and sometimes triple my wage that day based on what I would sell. And then from a college project, I got my first professional sales job. And this was selling technology and primarily selling it 
to, you know, big business. Johnson and Johnson was one of my first big accounts and then into the education market. And then from there, that was working at a dealer who was selling direct to the end customer. I ended up moving my way up that company, becoming their national sales manager. And then I was hired away by Hitachi America. And that was you know, a whole different level of sales because now I'm selling to distributors, I'm selling to dealers, but I'm also having to go out and have a ton of meetings with the end user because, you know, really my job was to sell for the sales rep that was in the room that was actually going to get the sale. And I had a lot of success there. I was their top producing rep in North America. And while I was at Hitachi, I was very interested in like, how could I really up my game? What could I do for myself? personally that would help me professionally. And that's when I started studying neuro-linguistic programming. So for two years, I used to get on a plane one weekend a month and go study NLP with a teacher and got my master's certification in that. What I found from NLP, my studies of NLP, is it definitely made me better in sales because it made me better with the conversation piece. But it also improved all the other relationships in my life because all of a sudden, my communication skills expanded tremendously. So from there, I worked in the industry for many more years, worked for a couple other companies. And the last company that I worked for in the corporate arena, it just really wasn't a good fit culturally for me. Like They didn't really have the same values when it came to customer management that I did. And I had built such a reputation on my relationships that it just didn't feel right. So I ended up leaving the industry. I went to help my NLP teacher grow her business because I thought, well, I kind of need to figure out what I'm going to be when I grow up, even though I was 40. Like, Really, I should have been grown up by then. And that was when I first started interacting with entrepreneurs. I was meeting all these amazing entrepreneurs that were super passionate about what they were doing, but most of them weren't making any money. And it was because they didn't understand sales. They didn't understand the sales process at all. And I started helping some of them on the side. Somebody pulled me aside one time and said, "Like, Why aren't you teaching this? Like, Why aren't you teaching people how to sell? And I always say... like, I looked at her and I was like, Well who would pay me to talk about sales? That seems really dumb because it felt very easy to me, right? I've been doing it for so long. So my business was really born out of that conversation of thinking, well, if people want this, if people will pay for this, I will happily do this all day long because I love the conversation side of sales. Like when you're actually having a back and forth exchange with a client, that's my sweet spot. So here I am six years later, having the time of my life, loving my business. Wow. 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 Now I want to address NLP that I want to talk about your books because people hear NLP, neuro-linguistic programming, and people who don't know what it is, but know just a little bit about it, they think it's some like dark art. They think it's like (laughs) manipulative, bad, evil. And really, I look at it as the art of connection, right? How do you connect with another human being so that they are open to your communication? You know, it's so funny that you said that because one of the rumors when I left the industry, people were shocked, frankly, because I had had so much success there that I just walked away from this industry. And one of the rumors that came back to me is because people were like, oh, she's helping somebody sell these NLP classes and she joined a cult. And I was like, what? A cult? Okay, this seems a little out there for me, especially if you know me. Like, that is the last thing I would ever do. Right. So, really, you know, NLP is about communication and it is about connection, like you said. And really, what it teaches and the stuff that I bring into what I offer to my clients today is flexibility to your behavior, flexibility to how you show up in a conversation. And it isn't so that you can manipulate anybody. It's so that you can put the other person at ease so they can be more of themselves. And in a sales conversation, when you can apply some of these techniques, you allow for the other person to feel safe with you. You allow for them to be more open to hearing your message. And more importantly, you allow them to be more revealing about what they need and want and how to earn their business. And I mean that sincerely. It is about earning their business. It isn't about taking. It isn't about forcing. It's not about mind manipulation. Like sometimes people go like, Ooh, can you like make people do things? I'm like, ask my husband. The answer is no, I can't make anybody do anything. Exactly. Hey, good looking. Are you currently getting paid to speak? Would you like to ramp that up? 
we can help. Book a confidential speaker strategy call with our team at doitmarketing.com slash call, and let's see what we might do together. The call is free, but the results may be priceless. Let's jump into your books because I see you've got two fantastic books. One is called The Selling Staircase, and that perhaps is the one that's more about this kind of Mm relationship-based selling, connection, communication, being open, being open and getting the other person to be open, right? So almost like a transparent peer-to-peer sales process where we're doing it with them. We're not doing it to them. Exactly. And then the other book is Buying Signals. So talk about both of those and kind of what your publishing journey was about too. Well, I actually have three books. So the first book that I ever wrote, I wrote before I started my business and it's called Six Word Lessons on Influencing with Grace. And it's really these tiny little snippet lessons on NLP. And I wrote it the summer that I was trying to figure out, like, should I go back and get a corporate job or should I start my business? I wanted to have something at the end of the summer that I felt satisfied that I had done well. So that was the first book. And then the second book, Buying Signals, was written out of realizing that the more I talked to people, like, you know, that person just gave you a buying signal. They're interested in going to the next step with you. And people be like, what? What's a buying signal? Like, what are you talking about? They want to buy from me? And I'm like, well, maybe it's your job to check it out. So that's what that second book was. And then the third book came out this summer. And it really is the book. I've always wanted to write about sales. So when I talk about sales, I always talk about... Yes, you know, you hear all about the sales funnel and how important it is to fill your sales funnel. And I get that concept. I believe in the concept. But I think where the sales funnel falls short is it doesn't really go into the conversation. Like, what are the steps that you need in order to move somebody from step to step to step so that you can exchange dollars for your service or product and or find out along the way, this is not an ideal client, and then do what I call bless and release those people So you're not wasting time and energy trying to convince somebody who doesn't have a need or a want to buy from you. So that's what The Selling Staircase is. Now, I think you also have a free book, which is specifically around closing. Yes. Now, the only word dirtier than NLP is closing. (laughs) Like, oh my God, because of course, everyone's thinking of the famous movie clip with Alec Baldwin, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, coffee is for closure. Old school boiler room, beat them over the head. Let's talk about in Nikki Roush world. Mm -hmm. What is your definition of closing and what needs to happen in any good sales process for that close to be easy, natural, comfortable, and organic? I love that coffee is for closers. That makes me laugh as a salesperson. (laughs) Okay, so the idea of closing and what needs to happen is you need to follow these steps that I offer in the selling staircase. There are five steps where it goes wrong and where it gets like people go like, what? This closing thing is so uncomfortable. It's usually because you're skipping steps in the process. So if you want it to be authentic, if you want it to be easy for you and the prospect, you've got to follow these five steps. And then when you get to this place of the close, it's so natural. They're so ready to have that close language issued to them that it doesn't feel like coming out of the blue. I mean, nothing's worse than meeting somebody at an event and having them come up to you and be like, David, I hear that you talk about speaking and I have this new software that you should totally buy for me. Do you want to buy it? And you're like, uh, who are you? Like, why are you just approaching me like that? That's somebody just skipping through all the steps and going right in for the clothes. And that's gross. You know, you're like, I'm not a big dollar sign walking around just wanting you to like say, take my money. Nobody wants to be treated that way. So when you go through these steps, the first step is introduction. The second step is creating curiosity about your product and your services. The third is a discovery. And that's really the like make or break moment. Do they have a need? And do I have a solution that meets that need? need. And then once you've done a great discovery, it's super simple to go to the proposal piece. And then once you've gone to proposal, you have to issue the close because again, some people will not decide, do I want to hire you or not until you issue that close language. So the ebook really focuses on kind of that little bit around discovery, little round of proposal, but really what is that close language so that when you're there, you know what to say because... You can't just say like, well, if they want to buy from me, they'll let me know. No, they will not. (laughs) 
I always say that people are lazy, busy, and befuddled. And when we're selling, the sales conversation and the sales process needs to accommodate people who are lazy, busy, and befuddled. If you don't ask me, it's like, uh, Nikki, sure, yeah, this was a great call. Thanks so much. You never made the ask. So not only am I not getting a chance to say yes or no, I'm not even thinking about, is there a decision? I'm moving on to the next crazy busy thing and my full email inbox and my next five meetings and my voicemail that's got 17 messages waiting for me. So I love what you're saying is give them an explicit opportunity to decide where do we go from here and ask, right? The magic of asking. Now, I want to talk about the difference because you have both this big, beautiful corporate sales background and entrepreneurial sales, if I'm an entrepreneur versus if I'm a big business and I'm in a business to business sales conversation, is it different if I'm an entrepreneur slash small business selling to a big business versus a big business seller selling to another big business buyer? Are there some differences there? Is the latter the same? Is the methodology the same? The methodology is definitely the same. There are some key things when you're selling to a corporation. However, here's the piece that I really focus on. And the piece that I think is really important is I focus on the relationship side of selling. And even if you say, well, I'm selling to Johnson & Johnson, right? For instance, you're still interacting with a person or people. And so acting as if they're just this one big entity, that's not going to build rapport. That's not going to build relationship. And realistically, whether you think people are making decisions based on relationship and rapport or not, they are. I mean, my background is selling into, you know, the biggest purchaser of technology in the world is the education market. And they have to go out to bid for everything. You know, everything is really, you know, crossing every T, dotting every I. There's a lot that goes into it. And I cannot tell you how many times my team, the dealer, the distributor that I was working with to get that business, how by building relationships with the end users, with the people in purchasing, with the people who were making decisions and evaluating product that it allowed for us to help influence what they were actually going to choose or what they were going to put out to bid. Now, the bid process is still, you know, again, you can't influence the bid process, but you can, by building relationships, have an opportunity to get in early to help write some of the bid specs or help them decide on, well, we need this and that because that's the product that I sell has. So it's still about relationships, regardless of the big you know, entity. The difference that I would say is remembering that sometimes you have to build relationships when you're selling to big business with multiple people in multiple departments. That's, I think, the difference. Yeah, no, that's a great, great point and a great difference that people should be aware of. Nikki, let's flip in to your business model because I'm sure people listening, when they go to yoursalesmaven.com, They see all kinds of cool things. I'm guessing that when you started your business, you were just doing one or two things. Maybe it was speaking and coaching, or you'll tell us what it was. But now it's evolved where you have membership. You have some programs for corporate sales teams. You have some programs for entrepreneurs. And you have this beautiful bouquet of investable opportunities. Talk about kind of what the offerings looked like on day one, and then how you decided to expand and evolve them to where they are now. I mean, the offering on day one was you could schedule a one hour or a two hour session with me. And that was kind of it. And then as corporations started approaching me of like, we would like you to come and do some training. Then I started developing some training modules for them. And then once I developed these training modules, I was like, well, everybody needs these. So then it became a course you know, that I sold over and over again for years and years that people could sign up for. And then all of a sudden, I got this great coach who said, you know, why aren't you offering, you know, private VIP long-term opportunities to work with you where you can really dig in and focus on somebody's business and help tweak those places where they need some adjustment. And at first I thought, well, nobody's going to hire me for that. Well, now VIP clients have become my number one source of income in my business because those clients that I get to really focus and work with privately, obviously they're getting, you know, phenomenal results because of that. And then I just got to this point where I have developed so many training modules that 
there needed to be a place for people to go and get access to, you know, I'm all about process and structure and giving people language. And so I really put together my community, my Sales Maven Society, which is the membership platform. I just put every piece of training that I've developed that has structure to it. So it feels like people are like not alone. Nikki's walking alongside me and I can kind of do it, you know, go and pick the piece that I need right when I need it. So now it's corporate trainings. Like you said, I still go into companies and do sales trainings and even communication trainings from time to time. And then, you know, my private clients that I work with just this last year started offering just a one-off strategy session with me because sometimes people just have like one thing they need support on. You know, it's like, Nikki, I just need to figure out what are the questions I should be asking during my discovery process because the questions that I'm asking are not getting me the results that I want. You know, so we work on that. And then the Sales Maven Society, which has really exploded this last year because it's a way for people to get continued access to me and access to all the content that they need when they need it and have this process and structure for following in the sales process. So that's how you work with me. Tremendous. That's really exciting. What a great episode. Wowza. Tell you what, if you want to ramp up your revenue as an expert who speaks professionally, you should really check out our free online training at doitmarketing.com slash webinar. Isn't it funny about the VIP days and the VIP day experience? Oh, no one's going to buy that until they all buy that. And that's the main thing now. We're having a conversation on multiple levels, how you do what you do, what you do with clients, and then kind of peeking behind the curtain about how you run your business. When people go to yoursalesmaven.com and they go to services and they open up all those fabulous menus, you are very open about your pricing. Prices are on the website. I know that a lot of our folks listening going, I'm afraid to put prices on the website because doesn't sales training 101 say you have to have the value discussion before the price discussion? And what if people think it's too much? What if some other people think it's too cheap? So how did you come to that decision of, you know what? Total transparency, here's what it costs, prices on the website, How did you come to that or did that even change over the years? You know, a lot of people said you can't put pricing on your website. A lot of people also told me I couldn't put sales in the name of my business, that it would fail miserably. So, you know, I don't always take what everybody thinks to be true. And when it comes to this pricing on your website, I'm going to say this is kind of a soapbox moment for me because yes, we want to have conversations and establish value. But the truth of the matter is think about how you make decisions when you want to hire somebody. If you go to their website and you don't see any pricing, do you then just like instantly schedule a call to talk to them to get pricing? Heck no, you don't. You go on to the next person who offers something that you want and you see if they have pricing on their website. So regardless of what your business is, if you think that people are coming to your website, not seeing pricing and go, Ooh, I'm definitely signing up for a consult call or a discovery call because they didn't have pricing on their website. That is baloney. And you are feeding yourself to something that is not serving you and not serving your business. The flip side of this is, you know, and actually I had one of my clients say this to me. She, (laughs) it was in a training. I teach a masterclass once a quarter and she raised her hand, like, because we were talking about pricing on website and she raised her hand, like almost like really apprehensive about doing it. And she was like, I just want to say that as a buyer, if I go to somebody's website and they don't have pricing and I have to call and ask them for their price, it makes me feel cheap. It makes me feel like I can't afford it. And that was like, okay, I hope everybody in the room heard this because the last thing you want is somebody having a conversation with you and already feeling apprehensive about asking you questions. And if they have to ask for your price, that's uncomfortable for them. Sales, in my opinion, is about relationships and it's about putting the other person's needs first and allowing for them to be comfortable, for them to feel safe with you. So I do want pricing on the website. And then one more thing about pricing on the website is I also don't want to have a bunch of conversations with people who say to me, when I reveal the price, have this like... I would have never paid that. Like, I never want to talk to those people because they start to make me feel like, oh, my pricing's too much. And now nobody will hire me. And that is not true. 
So I do think you have to put pricing on your website. And this idea of like people think it's too cheap. I have this really awesome client in Houston who was a private VIP client. And when he was deciding who he was going to hire, they heard me on a podcast. They got a hold of me, his team did. And they also reached out to two other sales professionals that are offering similar type services. One person wanted $100,000 to work with them. You know, somebody else wanted, I don't even know what it was. And so my price was by far the least expensive. He didn't go with me because it was the least expensive. He went with me because I speak his language, because my message really resonated on my ideas of what we could do to increase his close rate. And that's why he hired me. And do I think he needs to pay me $100,000 to do what I did for his business? No. And I'm totally fine with him what he did pay me. Like I feel good about it. He feels good about it. We have this great relationship. Yeah. Wow. What a great philosophy. I'm glad. Thank you for taking the soapbox moment. (laughs) Man, oh man, do people need to hear that message. Let me ask you this. When you transitioned out of the big corporate world, And I've had this experience with my clients too, that they're very successful sellers, they're big corporate salespeople, million dollar round table, whatever it is, all the awards, president's circle, president's Mm -hmm. club. Now they come into our world, they're selling speaking, training, coaching. They're like, this is hard. This is different. Number one, did you find it different doing the big kind of B2B sales versus selling yourself? I guess that's the main difference. We're selling ourselves and our own personal products and services. But I also think the training, speaking, coaching world is kind of weird in the sales process is very different than a traditional corporate sales process. How did you find that difference? And how do you coach people who may already be successful in one realm of selling, but now they're opening up a new chapter or they're pivoting or they're exiting their corporate job and they want to go out as, you know, a solo. How do you help them navigate the difference in the sales environment? So first, yes, I will say that initially there was some hesitation around doing this and, you know, setting my price in a place where I could actually have a sustainable business. I mean, you know, what I charge now for a strategy session and what I charged when I first started, it's a ridiculous difference, right? Here's what I think was the most profound thing for me is that I believe in personal and professional development. So I hired a coach right away. I hired a coach who knew how to do something that I didn't know how to do. And then I moved on from that coach to a coach who I swear it was like she walked around in my head with a flashlight and she'd be like, oh, here's a little blind spot that Nikki has. Like, oh, here's another little blind spot. And it was her that told me about offering VIP days. You know, she was just phenomenal. Where people struggle is they think they have to figure it all out on their own. And the truth of the matter is, as good as I am at sales, I still have blind spots. To this day, I always have a coach. I always have somebody who is teaching me things that I don't really know how to do. And could I figure them out? Yes, but I could spend five years figuring it out or I could hire a coach who knows how to do it and says, here's your blind spot, Nikki. This is what you need to do instead. So that's what I do for clients, especially those who are like, you know, I have all this sales background. I was uber successful, you know, like you said, President's Club, all these things. And now I'm struggling to sell my services. And it's usually because there are blind spots and they won't figure them out on their own. So you go and you get somebody who can help you see some of these blind spots and where you just need to make. Sometimes it's the tiniest adjustment that could just turn the faucet on. And now the conversations get easier. You are more confident in that conversation. You get to raise your prices often. So I think it's about really finding experts who can help you see your blind spots. That is very, very wise. In fact, if I were to look back on my career, my biggest mistake was I did not hire the coaches and the consultants and the mentors early on that I should have. Now I'm a coaching and mentoring freak. I say this not to brag, but I'm bragging. I pay my coaches more per year than some of my clients make in revenue well into six figures on my personal development because who am I to be a mentor and a leader in my industry if I don't believe in mentoring and coaching for myself? (laughs) I totally agree. 
So let's wrap up with two final questions. And like I said, we could have like five episodes together. This is so totally fantastic. My final, final question, Nikki, is going to be where can people get connected and stay connected to more of your brilliance? And then even before that, if people were to take one central idea from our conversation today, what would you hope that would be? The central idea that I hope that you'll take from this conversation is that most people will not decide to hire you until you ask them. So please ask them. Boom goes the dynamite. Now, (laughs) how do people get connected and stay connected to more Nikki Roush, YourSalesMaven.com? What can we give them? We're going to link all of this up in the show notes right below this episode at TheSpeakingShow.com. What can we give our folks? Go visit YourSalesMaven.com and then forward slash SSP for Speaking Show Podcast. And you can download the ebook, Closing the Sale, that you and I spoke about. So that will be my gift to you. That's free. Come get it. Download it. Go through it. Get some of that language. And then now you'll be on my website. And if you want to have access to me, reach out to me. You can find me on social media. I tend to spend my time on LinkedIn, Facebook, and a little bit on Instagram. So you can find me there as Nikki Roush or Your Sales Maven. And I would love to be connected. And if you have a question or a comment about something that I said today, reach out. Let's start a conversation. I love conversations. They do. They have questions. They have comments. They need help. (laughs) They need help. Connect with Nikki, YourSalesMaven.com forward slash SSP for Speaking Show Podcast. SSP. And that's a very generous offer. Thank you so much. And you know, I'm going to give you one of the highest compliments that I ever get, which is, Nikki, you are a person who walks your talk, right? All of the relationship building, all of the transparency, all of the things that you teach and coach, we experience when we listen to you, we experience in your books, we experience on your website. You are really modeling excellence for your clients. And I just appreciate that hugely. Thank you so much. I do believe in walking your talk and that is the highest compliment I have received in a long time. So thank you so much. Well, that wraps up another episode of The Speaking Show. Hey, tell you what, if you like us, rate us and review us on iTunes. Subscribe, tell a friend. Go grab the notes and downloads and extras at thespeakingshow.com. See you next time. 